does that have to be true? If Susan Wright were here this, this morning, would she say, oh my God, I never thought of that. Does it have to be true? Because what do we know about debits and credits? For every debit, there is an equal and offsetting what? Credit. credit, right? So basically, this relationship, which says that the balance in one account has to equal negative in the, in the other account, that just says the debits and credits have to offset each other. Okay? This is true. This has got to be true. Okay? So. We don't have this. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm sorry. Let me just go back. Uh, I'm actually, you have the notes. I'm going to go through another exercise. Um, so, in what sense to say that the current account is in deficit is simply to say that the capital account is in surplus. And that really gives you a better and fully picture of what it means to say that we have a current or a capital account deficit. Okay? Now, this is fairly mechanical. What I want to do is go back, and this is also actually, which I think about, a really nice review of some basic national income accounting. So I want to think about this uh, relationship that I just described to you in a slightly different way. Okay? So here's the way I want us to do it. Let's think about three different levels or three different kinds of an economy. Let's start off and think about an economy in which there are no imports and exports, so there's no trade, and also that there's no government. Okay? And what I want you to do is to think about what is true in this country about how you can make money and how you can spend money. So in this economy, there's only two ways to make money. You could produce and sell consumer goods, or you could produce and spend, or produce uh, and sell new capital goods. So you could make investment, or produce investment goods. So C means expenditure, or uh, uh, production of consumer goods. I means production of real capital goods that we use for investment. Okay? Now how could you spend your money in this economy? Well, in this economy, you could uh, either spend money on consumer goods or you could save your money. So you can buy consumer goods or you can save them. Okay? Now, it's got to be true that sources of funds equal uses of funds. Every dollar earned is used for something, okay? And so what we can conclude is that in this really simple economy, the level of investment is going to be determined entirely by the level of savings. Okay? Now, let's make life more complicated. Let's imagine an economy in which there is still no trade, but in which there is a public sector, that there is a government. And let's think about sources and uses. Well, how could you make money in this economy? You could produce new capital or consumer goods. You could produce and sell investment goods. So you could produce uh, 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 craft beers and, and, and nachos. That's consumer goods. You could make money selling that. Or you could produce 
trucks and computers, that would be capital goods. The other thing you can do in this economy is keep yourself out of jail by paying your taxes. Excuse me, uh, do that on the other side, my bad. Um, we're talking the sources side. The third way to make money in this economy is to produce and sell goods to go to the government. So you can make goods to sell in the private sector, you can make investment goods that would be bought by businesses, or you can sell stuff to the government. Now, uses of funds, could they give you subsidies? Yeah, uh, maybe that would be, we'll, we'll talk about that on the other side, but maybe. But that would be just a transfer within this sector. So how could you use your money? Well, you could buy consumer goods. All right. Uh, you could buy new capital goods, or you could pay your taxes. What that means is that in this economy, the level of investment is determined by the level of savings. Excuse me. Now, you could save. Hang on. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me slow down. How could you spend money in this economy? You could buy consumer goods. Okay. You could save your money, or you could pay your taxes. So now we say the level of investment is going to be the level of savings plus, actually I'll write it this way, minus government spending minus taxes. Okay, so let's think about what that means. What's another word for the difference between government spending and taxes? That's the deficit. Okay. The level of investment in the economy is determined by the base rate of savings but then when the government runs a deficit, they suck money out of the pool of funds that's available for investment. Okay? But now, and this is where we're gonna hook back around the discussion of the current account. Three. Let's imagine we have a world in which there's trade and a government. Sources of funds. Consumer goods, you can sell consumer, uh, 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 nachos and beer. Uh, investment goods, you can sell new trucks. Government expenditures, you can sell nuclear weapons to the government. The third or the fourth way to make money in this economy though is by exporting. So X means exports, all right? What about uses of funds? Well, the same story. You can buy consumer goods, you can save, you can pay your taxes, but now you have the opportunity to import. So M means import. And what's the conclusion? Well, the conclusion here is that in a world where we can trade, the level of investment is equal to the level of the savings, minus the government budget deficit, okay? But now we're gonna subtract out one more thing. Minus the difference between imports and exports. Okay? Now, hook this back around, we have a name for this. The difference between exports and imports. And we just gave it a name a minute ago. The trade deficit, or make it slightly more precise, that is the balance of the current account. Okay? So, what does that mean? Well, back, skip ahead here a little bit. Yeah, one second, let me find the slide. Okay, go ahead. Uh, why is the deficit, how does the deficit, if the savings is 
If investment is the savings that individuals make and give to banks, and the government runs a deficit, which means they spend more than the taxes, how does that additional spending come directly off of investment? Okay, what happens if the government runs a deficit, you think about that as vacuuming up some of those savings. Okay, so imagine, no, 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 let, me let me just throw some made up numbers out there real quickly. Let's suppose that in 2015, the total level of savings in the US was equal to, uh, uh, round numbers, $3 trillion. That was aggregate savings. If the government's budget had been balanced, and if there was no capital, excuse me, current account surplus or deficit, then we would have expected there to have been $3 trillion worth of new investment in 2015. But now suppose government spending is equal to, uh, uh, I'll pick a realistic number, uh, three trillion and, or four trillion, make it four, and taxes are equal to uh, three trillion. So the government has a one trillion dollar deficit. What that means is that a trillion dollars worth of savings has been sucked away by the government to pay for this deficit. Okay. That's money that's not available for investment. Okay? Now, to go back here, well, let me just ask you. I bet you know this even if you don't know the numbers. What has been true for the United States for quite some time now? Has that X minus M number been positive or has it been negative? Have we had a current account surplus or a current account deficit? We've had a deficit. And let me just show you the numbers. There you go. Okay. So. Uh, this is, again, yet, yet another of these charts, and oh, I, it obviously got, didn't get framed properly. Better. Yeah, that's, that's better. Um, okay, so uh, this is another one of these uh, 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 Fed graphs, I think, from 2010, but that was the long run trend as well as I need to. Uh, this is the U.S. current account deficit or excuse me, current account balance. Uh, basically, it's the difference between imports and exports uh, when imports and exports are broadened to include things like unilateral transfers, okay? And what you're seeing here is that really for the past 30-some uh, uh, years, the U.S. has substantially had a deficit in its current account. We have imported more than we have exported. And we've done that for, a, except for that one little bit uh, during the uh, 91 recession, uh, we have, have had a negative in our current account, okay? At the same time though, the U.S. has been quite prosperous. This has, in aggregate, been a time of pretty substantial economic growth. Now, I know we can complain about inequality, we can complain that growth has stagnated, uh, since 2008, but by and large, this has been a good time for the U.S. economy. So the question is, can an economy really thrive when we have a current account deficit? And the answer is clearly yes, that's what's happened in the U.S. And when you look at my equations down here, you begin to see why. If this X minus M number is negative, what that really means, so we'd be taking minus and minus, that contributes towards the overall level of investment. Okay. The fact that we have a current account deficit in the US means that we have had a surplus in the capital account. That means, in other words, money's been flowing into the US to create and purchase new capital. Okay? All right, so. I guess what I'm really trying to do here, oh, let me show you uh, my other favorite. This is my favorite. I don't, 
I use this all the time. I don't think I've shown you guys this yet, have I? Have we seen? I don't think we did. Uh, this is almost my favorite single graphic, and I really feel ashamed because I did not remember where I got this from. I definitely cite whoever it was created this map if I could. But, uh, but it's, it's, it's a true thing, and what this is showing you is the balance of the current account uh, by countries. So what you see <coughs> is the U.S. falling bright red. What that means is that we have a huge trade deficit. You can see that for much of the rest of the world, South America, most of Asia, and so forth, uh, their trade deficits have been relatively small. And where is, of course, the surplus coming from? It's coming from China. So what's really accounted for this pattern that we see in the numbers, and this is especially true after about the mid-1990s when China really, really liberalized and opened up. What this represents is, is trade relations between the US and China. Okay, so let me uh, kind of press on a little bit. And just a couple other things. Uh, I've got a bunch of graphics in here. Uh, this is the Japanese current account and capital account. Uh, you see Japan, uh, really, again, for the past 30 years, has had a current account surplus. Okay. Um, here's just some graphics about that. Here's some other countries looking at their surpluses and deficits. This really just says in graphic form uh, what my, my little cool little map said earlier. There we go. Okay. So what I wanted to end with uh, is kind of this question. Is the current account deficit a bad thing or a good thing? Okay. Um, so I guess here's, uh, did, uh, how many of you all, I'm guessing a lot of you had Thanksgiving with your fam extended families, right? Many of you did. How many of your extended families have a drunk uncle? <laughs> Mine. I often serve that role. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, you know who I mean. Uh, like, yeah, the guy is. So, so I. Uh, so you got. Uh, this is actually more of my wife's family. There's. No, actually, I have a lot of drunk uncles. Um, uh, but you know, these are guys like this is the old uh, sitting on the bar stool, uh, kind of talking about how America used to be kind of thing. And so sometimes drunk uncles will get into this little jag where they say, oh, I remember it used to be great. We used to make things in America, right? And now we just buy everything. And it's all your fault, millennials. Uh, this younger generation, all they want to do is they want to play with their PS4s and drive their Toyotas. And, you know, they just, they, they're responsible for the fact that America has all gone to hell. Okay. And that we've got this current, and basically in sort of uh, econ speak and not drunk uncle speak, what they're saying is uh, the U.S. is a bad thing because they have a current account of uh, uh, deficit. Okay, so this is kind of the argument that you will hear being made. One reason is we have a current, that this is sort of the drunk uncle story. Uh, we have uh, a current account deficit because our, our goods aren't competitive, right? The Japanese and the Chinese are so much better at making cards and assembling PS4s uh, that uh, uh, we can't compete. Okay, a slightly more sophisticated version of the drunk uncle argument recognizes that the flip side of a current account surplus is, excuse me, current account deficit is a capital account surplus. So the fact that um, we are importing so many Japanese, or excuse me, let's use China as the example, so many Chinese goods means that China has the resources to buy American, uh, to make investments in America. Okay? And that that is somehow a bad thing. I don't know if you remember about a year ago, plus or minus, uh, uh, the Chinese tried to buy uh, this big American pork producing company, Smithfield, right? And a lot of drunk uncles out there said, this is just terrible that 
uh, Chinese are going to now own an American uh, 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 food processing business. Uh, before your time, but if you go back to the 1980s, uh, a group of Japanese bought Rockefeller Center. Drunk uncles of the time said that this is really a bad, a bad thing because you know here Japanese are owning this iconic American uh, uh, piece of real estate. Okay, so that's sometimes why we hear an argument about how bad current account deficits are. The flip side of this, uh, though, and I think maybe I'm putting my thumb on the scale here a little bit, but share my views for what they're worth. Uh, the flip side is that we shouldn't really worry too much about current account deficits. In fact, I think there's an argument to be made that current account deficits are actually a sign of the country's strength, not a sign of the country's weakness. And let me explain the two bullet points that I've, I've got up here. So, and again, we should use the, the actual data, the actual history of the US. Um, if you'll notice, that the US has uh, a current account deficit, not just with China, but also let's pick uh, Japan as an example of this. We import a great deal more from Japan than the Japanese import from us, and our share, our level of Japanese imports, what, that is what we import from them, has been going up substantially for the past 20 years. The Japanese, their imports have been relatively constant for the past 20 years. Now there's a pretty obvious reason why that's true. Why have we been buying more and more Toyotas and, uh, and semi products? They're cheaper, but what else has been happening in the US for the past 20 years that has not been happening in Japan? Growth, all right? The Japanese economy has essentially flatlined past 20 years, actually more than that. But for the past 20 years, Japanese real incomes have not grown. Real incomes in the US have. So the fact that we are importing more from Japan than they are importing from us, that shouldn't be surprising, and that certainly shouldn't be good, bad news. That just means that we're becoming wealthier relative to the Japanese. So the fact that we have a deficit with the Japanese isn't a sign that the U.S. economy is weak. It's really a sign that the U.S. economy is strong. Okay. Now, the other kind of anti-drunk uncle argument here has to do with the capital account. The fact that we have a current account deficit means that we have a surplus in the capital account. What that really means then is that Foreigners are investing in the US, okay? You can take that as a sign of danger, but it should also, I think, be taken as a sign of strength, okay? Uh, and I use Japan, or excuse me, I use China as my number one example for this. The fact is that the Chinese have the opportunity to have a current account deficit anywhere in the world because they have the opportunity to invest anywhere in the world. The fact that the Chinese are especially interested in investing in the US is a sign of the relative attractiveness of the US as, as an investment venue as compared to the rest of the world. So, uh, imagine you're one of these rich Chinese guys and you're trying to get some money out of the country. You're trying to uh, uh, develop a foothold, make some investment somewhere else. You could go to Japan, but why would you go to Japan? Their economy is flatlined. Uh, you could go to Europe, but why would you go to Europe? The Eurozone is falling apart. Where do you go to invest? You go to the US. So the fact that, again, the sort of the circle of life here is that because we have a current account deficit means we have a capital account surplus. The fact that we have a capital account surplus means that most of the rest of the world has a great deal of confidence in the US economy. So if you worry about this, here's, here's some reasons not to worry. Um, I'll just kind of, uh, kind of skip over that and go to this. Uh, this is, by the way, not a new argument. 
you can go back to the uh, 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 18th and 19th century uh, and you can see exactly the same debates we're having now. Uh, these were the debates between the mercantilists and, and their opponents. So if you go back to the 18th century in, in, in Great Britain or the United Kingdom, you see people making exactly the arguments that drunk uncle is making today. Okay. Uh, they were called, not drunk uncle, they were called mercantilists. And the mercantilists were arguing that it's better to export than to import, and the public policy should be designed to promote exports and not to allow current account deficits to accumulate. Again, goes back 200 and whatever that is, 60 years now, uh, Adam Smith, uh, Ricardo, David Hume were all making kind of the anti drunk uncle argument. They were saying pretty much exactly in much more elegant, flowery 18th century prose, were making the argument that I'm making today. Um, okay, one more. I, I just can't not do this. Um, here's a dead guy that you don't know anything about, which is just a shame. <laughs> okay. uh, my guess is that none of you have heard of Herb Stein, which is, like I say, it's, it's just too bad. Uh, Herb Stein was uh, a really important economist in his day. He worked for uh, uh, Nixon and Gerald Ford on the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, uh, here's what he said, contrary to general perception, the existence of the current account deficit is not in and of itself a sign of bad policy or economic condition. So Herb was just saying, you know, don't worry about the deficit. It doesn't tell us anything at all. So uh, Herb Science said so much good stuff, it's hard to, uh, if you, you could just read a little book of his quotations and learn a lot. He was, by the way, uh, so he's, you know, a trained PhD economist, uh, except he had, he had another life. Uh, does anybody ever read in Washington Post or Slate, there's this advice column called Dear Prudence? Okay, if you've yeah. ever seen it, it can be entertaining. Uh, uh, but it's just one of these advice, you know, you advice, you write in and you say, I've got this problem. Um, Herb Stein had always wanted to write uh, an advice to the Lovborn column, and he was friends with Catherine, uh, come on, Washington Post, Cat what was Catherine? Ah. Anyhow, the publisher of the Washington Post. Uh, so he was buddies with her, and he said, I want to write an advice column. And she said, well, I don't think anybody's going to read an advice column written by uh, a middle-aged Jewish economist, right? That, that's not going to be it. And he said, okay, well, I'll, I'll be Dear Prudence. And for years, he wrote the Dear Prudence column, uh, advice to the love war. Uh, there's one, one other reason why you should know her side. He's Ben's dad. Um, everybody remembers... You guys remember Ben Stein, right? And the famous uh, Ferris Bueller? Okay, next time you watch Ferris Bueller, you should watch that once a month. Um, <laughs> next time you watch Ferris Bueller, listen to uh, Ben Stein's, when he's doing the Bueller, Ferris Bueller. He also giving an economics lecture, and his dad wrote out the lecture. Okay, so there you go. All right, um, I think... I am going to say we're done. Uh, yeah, there's just a couple other things in the notes, but I'm going to draw a line in the sand right there. So uh, uh, that's it for this mod. Um, I think I said everything I needed to say about the exam, sir. Uh, wait, so wait. the formula sheet is, are we going to have that for the exam? Uh, it's not really a formula sheet. It's one just to understand. So no, you can you understand how those formulas work, and I expect you to make up your own. Are you going to post a practice exam like you did for the midterm? Uh, I'll see what I can put together. Uh, but I think your study guide is really that's what I really want you to focus on. If I can put together some example questions, I will. But mostly rely on that study guide. Okay. You can't. You can't the first. I'm sorry, Scott. What was your? It's cumulative, right? Yeah, and the exam, remember, is from day zero to today. Uh, and it's, and don't try and outthink me. It's going to be, as best as I can, pretty evenly uh, distributed over all the material. I'm not going to overweight stuff since the midterm. 
Okay, so study everything. We, we know it all. So we can't bring anything with us, just pencil, calculator. Yeah, pencil, calculator. All right. Yeah.